Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the rules. Um, uh, ODI leads, welcome to our space. Um, some new faces here today, which is which is great. You found coffee, I guess. Um, the loser just by the lips. And if you uh, need any questions, the ODI leads team, most of them have got um, t-shirts on. Um, some forgot. Um, Tom, you can put your hand up. You've never. <laughs> Um, and I don't think we've got a fire alarm today, have we? No, so we're not expecting any fires either. Um, but if you um, need to leave the building, if there's a fire in here, we'll go out that door. Um, people have kindly put their suitcases in front of it. But um, and um, if if we're going out the other way, we'll just uh, follow us to the uh, the lifts, and then we'll go down the stairs. And if you know Leeds, we're in front of the Agra. So ODI Leeds, welcome. We innovate with data. You might get bored of me saying this, but if you are radically open, you can access the massive surpluses that exist around your data, your programs, your projects, your people. So remember that. If there's one thing you remember from ODI Leeds, that's it. Th this is amazing. So we are now five years old. We have 16 sponsors who have all realized that the world is going to be all about data, that we need to find some new friends. We can't do it on our own, basically. So uh, we work with all of these in different ways, with different priorities, but they all collaborate together on to various uh, extents, um, all working to innovate with data. And it's amazing. Five years ago, if you said we'd have a, a 16 core sponsors from across the public and private sector from loads of different uh, perspectives, um, we'd have said you were having a laugh. But um, you are more than welcome to check them out on our website and find out what they're all up to. We always mention Data Mill North. Uh, Data Mill North is the, I guess, widest used, most published, published to open data portal in the UK. Um, it includes data from public bodies and private sector organisations. Um, we started almost exactly the same month that uh, Data Mill North did. Um, we wouldn't have been successful without them, and they wouldn't have been as successful without us. So what, if you, what you've got is a, um, a fantastic um, data publishing portal, which was Data Mill, um, or Lee's Data Mill is now Data Mill North. And we try and encourage everyone to publish their data to there if they are they're going to make it open. So uh, some things to think about if you think about data. So think about the value and surplus around publishing. And um, we've been really happy to work with the um, Connected Places Catapult, get your name right now, um, on a number of their Plantech work um, over, the, um, over the last three or four years. Um, I think, can we announce that we've got another project? Uh, we're looking at a digital EIA project with the Connected uh, Places Catapult as well. And how do you create value and surpluses around all of that? Um, and then also not to forget that data equals power and to be careful about how you, how you wield that. Um, create data infrastructure um, and remember ethics and trust, but don't be limited by them and the new institutions that we're going to have to build to manage all of this um, because a lot of the current institutions uh, are not fit for purpose but i won't go on about that too much um what does that mean in the in the round so being radically open um, odi leads does um we have our open workspace here which is in four spaces which you'll hopefully have a chance to have a look around we've got our 16 sponsors who are all doing different things but have lots of common interests. We do our um, open innovation projects. We're doing one next week with um, with Yorkshire Water, but not for Yorkshire Water, if you like, um, about our, um, creating an impact dashboard for Yorkshire, whatever that means. Um, but we're going to find out. Um, and then we also build products and we do projects. So. Um, we don't like to talk much about it. We like to do things. So that's um, what we do in our radically open world. And then we've got two things that we're going to do more of uh, this year and next year. So our open GovTech um, work, we're going to put all of the stuff we've done, which you might call GovTech, 
um, over the last five years. Put it all in one place, find a load of friends, um, be radically open with it, and really push our open GovTech work with our, our friends. We're not quite sure exactly what that means, um, because we shouldn't know exactly what that means, because we're dealing with a, a, a complex system. But we're going to meet in Hebden Bridge uh, during Wuthering Bites on the 5th of September, if I got that right. 4th of September. Um, Giles, where are we meeting? Birchcliffe Centre. Birch Centre. And we're going to invite everyone along for an afternoon and we're all going to decide what Open GovTech is and what it should be and how people want to get involved. We're not going to own that, but we're going to hopefully, hopefully create the way in which other people can join in and share what they've been doing and create benefit from that. So that's our Open GovTech work. And then Open Data Saves Lives. Um, that's all about using data to save lives, but um, health, social care, each other, how that works, and that's going to kick off in January uh, 2020 with a very similar approach. Um, loads of people want to join in with them at the moment, um, so uh, if you would like to do that, just either find us on Twitter, uh, email us at hello at odileads.org, um, and um, join in. That's it. Join in. It will be fun. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I actually neglected to introduce who the speakers are this morning, so I apologise for that. But first up, we'll, I'll be introducing Chris Pope from um, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Um, following that, we'll have Neil Wilk Wilkinson from Gateshead City Council and Ashlyn Conlon from the Catapult. Um, Paul Downey from MHCLG and finishing up with Giles Dring from ODI Leeds. So, um, can I hand over to you, Chris? Thank you. We won't start at the end, I'll just try and skip backwards to the, to the start, hopefully. There you go, you got a nice little uh, preview of the presentation there. In Greater Manchester, we're starting off with a question, and the question is, how do we create a plan for 10 local authorities with differing local housing needs, with differing supply rates, and with differing policies and priorities. It's a challenge that we face every day, whether that's in looking at the data or the tech that we need to, to answer some of these questions, or whether it's in working through processes to ensure that we are working with the right people uh, across Greater Manchester. Greater Manchester is a fairly diverse area. It's, uh, it's just to the west of us now. Um, 2.8 million residents that we're kind of uh, working for. We're working with 10 local planning authorities, Boltonbury, Manchester Oldham, Rochdale, Stockport, Salford, Tameside, Trafford and Wigan, and I'm hoping I've got all of them there. But jointly, we're trying to create one local plan. And we're trying to find the right way to do that. Now, for us, we've always said that data is a foundation uh, for a good local plan, for a sound local plan. And um, I think if you talk to any planners, I think they might disagree and they may say, uh, ensuring that all of the politicians are happy with what you're doing is, a, is the basis of a sound local plan. But we've always said data is very much the foundation. Data needs to be useful. It needs to be something that we can use in some way, shape or form. More importantly, we, that we can uh, reuse as well. It needs to be something that's easy to access, so it's not something that's in PDFs. You know, it's something that we can maybe query at a later stage. It needs to be accessible, not just to planners, not just to public policy officers, but also to the general public as well. We need to make sure that the general public is, sees what we're doing and we're open and transparent about what we're doing. The data should be able to be queried. We should be able to ask questions of the information that we're using, and other people should be able to ask those questions as well. So we can't, as I said, have things in PDFs, can't have drawings that people have sent in and just say, oh, you know, this is the data, this is the information. It's not helpful. What we really need is the detailed background information behind that. And I think the two further challenges that we're facing really is uh, to make data a foundation. How can we ensure that the data that we're collecting especially for the call for sites that I'm going to take you through in a second, uh, how can we ensure that it's relevant to each and every area? Bearing in mind that everyone's got different policies and priorities, but it's also consistent and comparable across those 10 areas. 
If you asked any local planning authority to run a call for sites process, they would run it in their own way. They'd collect the information in their own way. They'd hold it in their own systems. We're having to do this for 10 simultaneously. So how did we go about doing that? Well, firstly, we had a look at some of the main challenges that we were facing. And I think if anyone's uh, read that National Audit Office uh, report that came out recently around challenges in using data across government, it's, it's a really useful tool. Uh, sorry, a really useful uh, document. It kind of sets out some of those three main challenges. And I think the interesting thing about these three main challenges that the NAO uh, puts out there is that actually they're like dominoes. If you focus on data being a priority, then actually the other two will fall. People will understand the quality of the importance of the quality of data. They will focus on improving data quality. And you won't have to do, as we've often done, kind of have a, cult, a culture of just tolerating and working with bad data and just kind of working around systems rather than fixing the system. But we also face a number of challenges locally as well. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of them. I might just pick one or two out. Um, there's definitely a culture of document-based work taking information, taking data, and rather than sharing the data, sharing a summary of that information. Yes, yes, because it's, yeah, I know. Yes, yeah, and, and, and we, we, we have that, we have a thing where we have lots of reports kind of shared rather than necessarily the data where people could extract their own information from that. Uh, we have a very, very time and capacity. There's not every local authority has got the same uh, time and capacity to, to devote to these things as others. Um, there's also variant definitions. So here's an example from just from Greater Manchester alone, safeguarded land. There's a different uh, definition from two different local authorities. Some safeguard land for future development, some safeguard land from future development. Now, if we just said, can we have access to your safeguarded land, we wouldn't know that kind of that, fo that further detail in the background. There's also variant definitions I have found when working with planners uh, about the definition of uh, what a deadline is. But anyway, that's, that's just a, a side point. So our solution, and I, I know a number of people in the room will have already seen something like this, uh, is Mapping GM. Mapping GM is a single website. It's got a range of different maps on there. It's developed by a Greater Manchester Combined Authority with Salford City Council uh, a number of years ago. This was slightly before the GMSA was set up. So this was by an organization called New Economy that was then kind of subsumed within GMCA. It's a single website for all of Greater Manchester. It hosts a variety of information about planning, about housing, about people, uh, about place. And we're trying to create this as one single store, one single place for geospatial information in Greater Manchester. Because it's a single website, it's one single data collection point. Now, if anyone's run a call for sites process, they know that you'll be collecting information from people sending in letters, people sending in emails, some people may even still fax nowadays, but there you go. Uh, but this was trying to create one single data collection point, trying to make sure that there's one point that everyone goes to and submits their information in a consistent and comparable way. It also meant that we could uh, save that information for all the 10 local authorities and make it accessible from one database in the background of all that information. We can make that information easily accessible back out to both the public and to planners as well. So we can have closed systems as well for the planners just to see stuff and to kind of interrogate the data in a bit more detail, but open systems as well for, uh, for the public to be able to see what people have submitted so that they can, I got, actually I was gonna suggest that site as a potential new site for development but actually I don't necessarily need to now. We use ordnance survey maps in the background to ensure that there's a level of accuracy as well with the sites that people are submitting when they're drawing on the sites. Uh, we, also can, we also have on the website over, I think it's over 300 uh, data sets now, all open data sets, largely, um, from uh, planning and housing backgrounds. So there's lots of information there on um, the, uh, the land supply from each of the local authorities, from the, um, from natural England, from historic England, from uh, the utilities providers. So we try to pull together information and present it all in one single website so that everyone can see uh, a place in context. It's, you know, we're using open source software, so are we using open source tools here? So we've got uh, GeoServer serving the information out and we've got Leaflet just as a very simple JavaScript library to be able to kind of show the maps uh, on the website. And as a result of that, it's scalable. It's something we can expand if we really wanted to, to look at other areas. It's repeatable, so other areas could just simply take that and look at their own area uh, and, and put it in place there. And it's modular as well, which means that we can add in new analysis, new tools, 
uh, to build on that and to provide more context to both the public and for uh, planners. Because I've only got 10 minutes, and I think I've used up about eight to nine of them, I'm not going to go through it in great detail uh, in terms of kind of showing you a video or kind of browsing around. But this is kind of the main page that you come to when you, when you look at our COV sites that we ran. Uh, about 1,000 sites were submitted, so you know, about 100 per local authority over a around a year's period. Most of those came through, uh, through online, through the system, so people go on, and I will jump over here. If you actually go onto the website, there's uh, a range of tools on this side here. And this tool here, you just click on it, you zoom in wherever you want to submit a site or suggest a site, zoom in, draw the boundary of the site that you're suggesting, and then you'll be faced with uh, the next sheet, which is just a very simple form. It's a standard form that we worked with the 10 local authorities to identify all of the information that they want from a COV site. So whether or not it's useful to Wigan or whether or not it's useful to Bolton, we'll ask the same information regardless of where people are submitting the site. That all goes into kind of a background database and that means that and we go through a number of processes. I think the first process is more of a, a review submission section where we ensure that people haven't you know, submitted like a rude picture or something like that or haven't just said test, 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 test or sworn at us repeatedly uh, in the form. So we do have a bit of a validation process, but then once we've got that validation process, it then goes through to an analysis map for the planners to be able to look at all these, these sites in context. You've got a range of different uh, tools down the left-hand side here. You might not be able to see them uh, right now, but if you go to uh, mapping, yeah, mappinggm.org.uk, you should be able to see some of the information uh, that we pull out there. This is kind of closed for uh, local planners. We've got lots of information in the background there, whether it's the boundaries or aerial imagery for them to zoom down and have a look in a bit more detail, poverty and deprivation statistics, or the planning and development side of things as well. And it means that they can zoom into each and every single one of those sites, find out more detail about those sites, and also submit extra information. Information that, I mean, if you've ever worked with planners, there's a lot of information usually just kind of in their heads, or they've talked to someone, and it's down in a report somewhere. We're trying to get that out of there and try to ensure that it's in a database that we can query, we can look at, and we can find out more information. So there's lots of information in there. We don't just gather the information, we query it, we provide information back to the planners uh, so that they can make uh, better decisions about their plan and how we, uh, how we take forward potential sites. But there's more to it than just this tech side of thing. The, the, the whole reason that this has been a success really is because Greater Manchester's had more than 30 years of working closely together voluntarily. The 10 local authorities have done this for the past you know, 30 years, since 86, uh, when the Association of Greater Manchester Authorities was set up. So we understand how useful it is to work across the different areas, uh, but there's still issues that arise, nevertheless. Uh, it's important to get people together and to talk about these things and to identify a way forward rather than uh, just simply putting in a tech solution. Uh, for us, bottom-up is always better than top-down. Uh, it may, may differ if you're in London, it may differ very uh, uh, substantially. But for us, working together and building uh, data schemas up from the bottom is, uh, is really useful. But without this, this is the reason why, you know, this, this cooperative working is the reason why something like this has worked. And I think, although I said data is a foundation, there's a big thing there about relationships. So we do need to consider those. I uh, just want to end on something that, that may be sacrilegious to say, uh, the Plantech event, but essentially a technical solution isn't always the right solution. We need to find out what the, what the correct solution is first. And for us, it was that cooperative working which allowed us to build a data platform and then allowed us to build Mapping GM. Okay, okay thank, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Chris. Um, if you can hang up there for a couple of minutes, we'll open up to the floor if there's any questions. Sure. So, um, hi, I'm Paul um, ODI Leeds. So, so what do you say to people when the the response is, oh, we can't do this, it's too hard, or the data's in the wrong format, um, you need to do the cleaning for us. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the people at Greater Manchester Combined Authority, we're, we're, not, um, we're not responsible for the local plan effectively. It's, the t it's a joint one between the 10 local authorities, so we are an effectively a supporting mechanism for them. So if that needs to be done, then we will try to do it. 
Well, actually, the best thing to do is to get those relationships in the first place, identify the information that they need, and see whether or not actually this is something you can provide, or is it something that you've never collected before, you've never thought about collecting before, and then start to build that. And we've been building that over a number of years now. Mapping Gems is five years old this year-ish. Um, so it's, it's something that you just need to build. You need to invest in the time, the resources, with the relationships first, and then you can get the right data schemas that are built from the bottom up rather than saying, this is how you have to do it. That would be our approach. Yeah. Work it on this particular uh, data sets you are collecting from a different, like. So what, what data sets are we collecting? Yes. So you can access them all at mappinggm.org.uk forward slash metadata. So it's got the kind of the full list there of absolutely every data set we've got. Yes. But we these, are, these are the you know unstructured or uh, structured data by uh, refined. Usually it's structured data, but if there's kind of any unstructured data, we'll let people know about that and we'll let them know either the sources or the people to get that information from. Uh, we always direct people back to the main source of the data. We don't, try, we don't see ourselves as like, we are the source of the information, we are just users of the information. We'll send people back to where- You are collecting data from different sources also? Yeah, 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 so from uh, public bodies, private sector organizations, voluntary community sector organizations, local planning authorities, Anywhere where there's useful information that will help us. And as per the GNCA, you know, you have de developed, uh, you know, some form like that. Sorry? Forms like that, which you have just collecting the data information. Only yeah, so, so, that, so we, we'll send that information. So with the call for sites, we sent that specific form out, and we had that specific form on the website. So if anyone wanted to submit something not on the website, we asked them to fill in that form and provide us with a little bit more. You are targeting audience also? You are targeting audience also? Yeah, we've got, well, I... It's the public, it's generally the public for the call for sites, it's generally the public, so it's literally anyone, anyone who wants to submit something, whether or not it's a developer or whether it's a member of the public. Any other questions? Uh, it's not really a question, more an observation. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, Leeds City Council. We're, fingers crossed, adopting our development plan tomorrow at Full Council, a process that started in 2012, so it's taken us seven years to get there. Um, and I would, I would say a, a large part of the reason why it's taken that long is because we started without any of that kind of structure of data or uh, un underneath, there was no data foundation for the, for the plan other, other than sort of a, a, a massive variety of spreadsheets and, and, uh, and, and maps and paper plans spread all over the place. So I, I, I just, yeah, if, if, if we could go back in time and have something like that to begin with, I mean, we're obviously getting closer to having that kind of information now, but certainly, yeah, the, the process of doing that for Leeds, dealing with a single authority, that's been difficult enough. I, do, I don't envy you having to deal with 10 different authorities, 10 sets of elected members and their various political persuasions. But lo looking at that, you, you've you know, it's an excellent, excellent way to start. Well, well thank you. you. I wouldn't say it's 10 times as difficult. It's probably like 10 factorial because <laughs> actually you've got to, you know, it's the relationships with everyone as well. Thank you very much, Chris. We're okay. going to move on to uh, Gateshead with uh, Neil Wilkinson and Ashton Con Conman from the Catapult. Uh, before I start, I must stress I'm a planner. <laughs> I am not digital at all. I started my planning career 30 years ago. On I, I, I start with the fountain pen. I, didn't, I wasn't actually given a computer till I was uh, in, in 2000, so I'm an actual technophobe. Um, but I suppose from my point of view, I recognize that um, digital is, is the way forward for Gay said. And uh, as, as, a, as a council, we're always very forward looking and we want, to, we want us to take, uh, take things forward. Just a quick summary, so I'm Neil Wilkinson, I'm a planner, I manage the environment team, the housing team, and the planning team, um, so I've got quite a big spectrum underneath me. Gates said, if you're not aware where we are, we're northeast of England, uh, we're on the south bank of the river to Newcastle, we call ourselves the little brother of Newcastle, uh, we have a joint local plan with Newcastle, um, similar to what the gentleman was talking about with Greater Manchester, it's, it's, it's not until you start joint working with another authority, you suddenly realize there's definitions that you had assumed for the last 30 years with the common definition aren't the common definition. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. Um, so, next slide. Um, 
When we started off in digitization, I, I was always naive of the assumption that, that planners were really well digitized. Yeah, we've all got iPads, we've all got computers, we're brilliant, aren't we? We've got, you know, we're really, really digitized. And then when we saw this document here, we thought, well, hang on, we're not that much above um, agriculture and, and herding, you know. So from our point of view, we, we had to take a, a bit of a relook at ourselves and understand what, what do we mean by digitization as an authority. Um, so similar to the previous conversation, we've got reams and reams of PDF documents. So all we've done really is taken a very paper-based exercise and made it into a, an electronic paper-based exercise. We hadn't really embraced digitization at all. Um, Gates said, the really main problem for Gates said is um, we have a joint plan with uh, Newcastle. Uh, Gates said has to uh, pr provide 11,000 homes. We have done a bit of development in the green belt, but our councils were very, very clear. You have to focus on your brownfield sites first. Our brownfield sites uh, tend to be very small. They tend to be very difficult. They tend to be uh, covered in, in industrial mining legacy, and we've got real development viability issues. So for us, it was really trying to understand how could we, once we've got the Greenbelt sites up and running, which for you planners in the room, is it takes three or four years to get the uh, major house builders to, to up and running, to start focusing on, on the smaller sites. So when I mean smaller sites, I'm meaning sites 50 units and under uh, within Gates. So we've got a lot of sites. We've got in a region about 120 sites, which are, are small sites, and they're very tight, small sites. And again, for the non-planners, the volume house builders, Taylor Wimpy's, Persimmons of the world, will not touch small size. They will just not touch anything below 50. They just will not go anywhere near those. So we're looking at a, a small builder, medium-sized builder, and we need to focus on how we can support them. Sorry. Um, we're one of the few authorities in the northeast of England. Uh, we really made in our brownfield register. Uh, so we pulled together our brownfield register. We were a pilot authority for the brownfield register. And we'll probably come on to it later on, but we've, we've also majored in the, we're the only authority in the northeast of England that's, that's majored on permissions in principle. So we're really focusing on how do we make it as easy as possible for old industrial sites to be de risked so new houses can be built in Gateshead. That was a headline in our local paper. So we're, we're one of the few authorities in the northeast that's doing this. Our neighbors are tending to release large, large areas of Greenbelt land. Um, our members did not want to do that. So next slide. So when we started looking at digital, we did start thinking, well, could digital help us support the redevelopment of brownfield sites? How could, how could we support housing on brownfield sites, increase developer competition and consumer choice in the market, and support SME developers to, to build and scale up? One of the issues, when we started talking to our small builders, uh, we, we had a workshop with our small builders, and we invited every single small builder who has been working in Gator for the last five years. There were five builders. There's hardly any small builders left in Gateshead. They got wiped out in 2008. They were just absolutely slaughtered. And we sat down with them and said, What's, why aren't you building? What's the problem? And they said, your big problem is you planners. You're a big, big problem. Um, you're, you're treating us like the metal volume house builders. When you put a planning application in, you want the same data sets that a Barrett's or a Persimmon want. You, you can't, we can't, and you hold all that data. So you're asking us to submit all the data that you hold, but you won't release that data. So what they really did plead for us was, can you please put your data on that and can you start supporting us and you can start de-risking your sites? For us as a council, we've, it's, it makes economic sense because we want houses to be built. Uh, for every house we build, we get a £1,000 council tax a year on average. So it makes sense for us to build. Also means the small builder tends to be the Gateshead Pound. It tends to be a person based in Gateshead. If it's Persimmon Homes, they tend to bring in subbies from Leeds. Um, you know, these people will benefit. They don't bring in local subbies, they just bust them in from wherever. Um, also, it goes to, well, big shareholders and, and massive bonuses, doesn't it? So that's, that's one of our issues. And to be fair to the volume house builders, they, they were telling us ourselves, they want the small builders to get strong again as well. They, they were saying you should be building, supporting small builders. Um, so we secured the funding from Future Cities to start a digital planning project. I'll tell you a little bit about what our process was. So um, my name is Ashling. I lead the insight and service design team at the Catapult. And for somebody who leads uh, a digital team, I'm a bit of a Luddite. 
when it comes to uh, kind of digitizing technologies, so or you know digitizing services. I, we very much adopt a human-centered approach, so any approaches that we adopt will involve an awful lot of talking to people first. So for this project, this is what we adopted. We spent some time identifying our five uh, SME stakeholders, <laughs> but we also spoke to volume builders, funding bodies, uh, we spoke to developers within the council, we spoke to um, basically uh, interview, did exploratory interviews with everyone who was touching these brownfield sites or everyone who wouldn't touch the brownfield site specifically. Um, our second stage was we analyzed the interviews to work out what was important. We created a prototype, tested the prototype, and then engaged in a development cycle. Um, and that's kind of where we are now with the product. But what I want to tell you a little bit about is what emerged from the research because we found it really, really interesting because it really helped to shape what the tool was going to be. So when we first started exploring this project, we thought that what we were doing was just going to be opening the data. We thought that, you know, we were po pooling the data, we were opening it up, we were going to try and make it accessible. Um, and what we found out was actually, as is often the case, a digital solution isn't always the best response. And actually, whatever tool we were going to build, the tool was going to have to facilitate relationship building because what had happened through lack of trust, lack of integration, lack of kind of conversation between all the stakeholders or a lack of open conversation at least was that a lot of resentments had built up um, where the SME developers didn't like the volume developers, the volume developers didn't like the SME developers, also didn't like the council. In fairness, nobody liked the council at the time. <laughs> Despite the fact that Gateshead really had the best interest of the developers who were operating within that sphere at heart. Um, and that kind of, you know, that understanding was built throughout the co course of this project. As I said, we adopt a human-centered uh, process, so I talked about that briefly already. Um, and to entry. Um, shouldn't be a massive surprise to a lot of the people in this room if this is what you're navigating, but the problem was it costs a lot of money to start developing a brownfield site. And if it costs a lot of money to start developing a brownfield site, people don't want to spend that money up front. Um, the planning process is perceived to be protracted and laden with red tape. I don't know how, you know, I think that might be something you're familiar with. Um, and over here, this is probably where this was really, really important. Developers can't wait. Timelines are short when cash flow is limited. So that meant that SME developers felt like they were being frozen out of the development process because they didn't have enough time and enough kind of upfront capital to invest in the protracted planning process. We also spoke a lot about permission and principle. Gates that are kind of spearheading this work, which is why it was really interesting to see where the pre-app process exists at the moment and what the developers want. So the developers want a, you know, a solution where they get pre-packaged sites with a guarantee of planning permission with all site investigations insured by the council. Now, sounds ambitious, but I don't see why we can't work towards it. <laughs> but that's what the developers wanted. Um, this was also super interesting. Um, these were the pain points that emerged from the research that we did. So assessing viability was a massive pain point. Remediation was the biggest pain point, probably. In Gateshead, it's particularly a problem because it's such a, it was such a strong mining kind of center. Um, you know, one of the things that was said is we had 34 units for private sale in redacted, <laughs> and we knew that if we lost a unit, we wouldn't be able to move forward. So like, if they lost one unit within this 36 unit site, they wouldn't be able to move forward because they wouldn't be able to make their profits. So remediation was incredibly cost, is incredibly costly, and it is a barrier, to, massive barrier to entry to SME developers. Timescales were a problem. Negotiations and funding, also problems. Um, I won't go into this in detail, but I'm happy to share the slides with, because I'm, I see that we're kind of running out of time. Um, I'm happy to share the slides with anyone who wants to see them. But fundamentally, the challenge summary we had was that we needed to um, we needed to make the pre-app process appear more consistent uh, to remove the kind of time costliness or the time spend as well as the upfront cash spend. Uh, the planning process is perceived to be high risk by developers. Um, even when we open the data, even when we share the information, the process itself is still considered to be high risk, obviously because people make decisions. People have to make decisions. Um, the rules for SME developers believe that because the rules are, their rules are different for them, but the demands are the same. 
uh, giving away too much data poses risks. That was an internal kind of barrier um, when we were interviewing internal council staff members. Um, the planning process was perceived to be ambiguous and lack consistency. So basically, the tool that we developed was going to have to be something that ticked all of those boxes, that kind of uh, solved all of those barriers and problems. Um, the interesting thing about when we were um, developing the tool, um, the tool that we developed wasn't what we thought we were going to end up with. And we actually had to pivot three times during the development process because every time the developers saw it, they were like, we don't like it, it's not helpful. So we had to keep changing how we were giving them information. We had to keep changing how the tool was communicating, um, was communicating things like the rules that were being applied to a particular site uh, in order to make things more easily accessible. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Neil. Yeah. Um, so, so the developing the functional specification, so, so really for us, the, the main was the end user focus, so picking up on what was said before, I as a planner think I know what the developer is really interested, I'm a policy planner, so I thought END 12 was really interesting for everybody, um, but uh, no, uh, what they really wanted to understand was, was the hard data, the infrastructure data, where, where the trees are, what, what contaminated land is like. So for us, the end user focus was really tailoring our data to what the, the end user really wanted, um, and not, not fancy little twiddly bits about planning policy. Um, uh, we made sure it was all open data. One of the issues for the small builders was that they, they, they don't have much upfront costs. Uh, not, uh, they can't handle much upfront costs. Um, they're very much hand to mouth, so that they need to make sure that the data they have is, is, is open and clean and, and, and cheap. Um, the, 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 one of the key issues for us it had to be agile, modular, uh, uh, and also scalable. And when I mean scalable, I mean for us, we wanted to not only stop at this point, there's probably other f users that we could come on to. I mean, one of them was, it's interesting on the Gates, um, the Greater Manchester one, one of the issues we, we were looking at now is whether the data that we're gathering is also data that we'd use for our SLA. So whether we could look at it from a different angle, this is all data the developer would find interesting, but it's also interesting that us as planners are interesting, is the site deliverable, is it del del deliverable, developable, whatever, yeah, those tests. So um, we try to, so we, for us it's about making it, changing the focus as well, so whether we could use the same data sets um, to, to make it more, uh, uh, use it for different functions. Um, so where we are at the minute, I mean, we, we've, uh, we've, we've, got the, um, we've got the spin reviews finished and we've got the prototype up and running. Uh, one of the key areas that we found being gates, uh, one of the issues was our contaminated land register and our contaminated land data was very, very paper-based. It was very, very poor. It, I was, it's quite surprising. We're, 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 I think, the third most mined authority in the whole of the country. Um, our data sets were just uh, all paper-based. Um, so we worked with the British Geological Society to try and get our contaminated land data sets um, organized. I think we picked that up from Greater Manchester, actually. We picked up, they've done some work with yourself, haven't they? So we picked that up. Um, so what we've done really is, is do a risk-based assessment because what the developers were interested in is was not necessarily uh, being averse to um, developing sites that were contaminated. It was just trying to understand what the risks were on that site. We did talk about putting a value on those risks and some of the values on these things, but the developers said, no, don't do that, because your, your, your values are based on, on, your, on your own assessments. They have their own assessments. They have their own trusted colleagues. Um, so we've finished work with the British Geological Society, and we're ready to go to procurement. For people who work in the council, um, that's, a difficult, that's not so easy. Um, we have to do an internal business case for funding, which we have done. Uh, really, the business case is about how much office time we can save. Uh, because of its data sets, uh, contaminated land's a good one. I have officers, when a site comes in, going through lots of historical maps one by one. It takes hours for them to do it. If it's all on one data set, then I'm saving hours. And, and that's one of the key areas of the business plan is it just saves hours and hours of time for officers. We need to procure a software developer. We have got some initial in, uh, interest from some software developers. That's causing a bit of a problem for us because more than one uh, procure, that means I have to go through a proper procurement exercise. As I said, the British Geological Survey is, is completing its work. The learnings for me were it's, it's, it's an opportunity to improve staff efficiency and data systems. 
Like all local authorities, I'm losing staff all the time. Um, this is, is a way of managing that process. As, as long as it's the data is, is, is handled and, and carefully put into one place, it means that I don't have to rely on, on staff. Um, like a lot of authorities, I'm losing staff. So my contaminated land officer is 65. He will be going. And I've been spending the last year trying to make sure everything is digitized and put onto a system. So when he goes, I don't lose all the data. Uh, Challenges has been the guardians of the data, real, real problems in, within the organization about data holding and professionalism. Property won't release their land holding data because they're worried about people misinterpreting the data. Corporate approach and sponsorship has been a challenge. Um, unfortunately, councils do work in silos and it's difficult to try and get our digital team engaged, as we found. Um, and it was collaboration and capacity building within the council has, has been a major challenge. And also, it, and to some extent we're getting there people it was a hard sell for our planners to be told that they were the problem and the reason why house building wasn't happening um it was a very difficult process um so it was quite a i mean for me putting aside all the data processing the work we did with yourselves identified the real system failures within our organization just going through that process i identified a lot of systems failures that we we, we have been rectifying Thanks, guys. We've got time for one quick question. That was really interesting. Anyone? Takers? It, it's just a question of uh, if, if Connected Cities Catapult hadn't been kind of working with you, how long do you think this would have taken you to, to do internally? Uh, I, to be honest, I wouldn't. We wouldn't have done it. It's a simple answer. Uh, our, our, our internal digital team, we're just not, we wouldn't have done that, no. No. I mean, the str if I'm being frank, that, that, that we're struggling now because we don't have the, the support now. So even though we have a, a working prototype, we are struggling now with our digital team. So the, the, the simple answer is we wouldn't have even embarked on it, really. We may have bought an off-the-peg type solution, but but that, no. But we wouldn't have gone through those systems that we went through, which was looking at what are, what is the system, what do people want. And as you said, the user research was, was, was really good for us, not just on the digital side, but also for us to improve our systems. One of the outputs of that was we totally reorganized the, the, the teams. Um, previously, we, we had all our teams like transport and transport team. We had historical people. So all the specialists were in their little silos. What we found out from this data research was that they couldn't work in their little silos. We brought them all into one team under one team leader. So to try and pull it all together. So it wasn't just the digital. It was the process of going through and understanding what our users wanted from us have to say just really really quickly that's that was what was really really wonderful about working with Gateshead on this project because this is almost always what happens when you do user research when you adopt a user-centered approach you find out that usually about 60 percent of the problem is just people believing things are done the way they're done and you can't how can you possibly start to untangle that knot um, when we started pulling out that there were some organizational or some structural solutions that you know, if you put those in place before you procure the digital solution, actually your digital solution will be much more effective. Gates said we're really willing to kind of take that on. A lot of the time people can get quite defensive because they don't like hearing that the problem starts with them. Nobody does. I wouldn't. So, you know, that was what was really great. And it was what was great about the SME developers as well is actually when they got the opportunity to start building those relationships, they were willing to do it. So that we were really lucky to be doing this project with Gates said. Thank you, guys. And we're going to move on to Paul Downey from MHCLG. So this has to be yeah. Okay. Um, so hello, I'm Paul. Um, I run a small team in um, Ministry of Housing. It's a digital team and it includes policymakers, which I think is quite novel. Um, and we're trying to solve a problem, which is basically we're trying to fix the broken housing market. Um, which, when I first joined the department, I was quite embarrassed to say I was doing that. But uh, having met some economists, I've been told that's exactly the right approach. That um, one of the, the sort of uh, things you learn in economics is um, that one of the reasons why marketplaces fail is lack of in information. You know, if I have more information about than you do, and we go into a negotiation, I'm going to win. And I think that's the kind of case in the housing market. Some people know where to build and how to build, and a lot of people don't. And so we can make more data available. We can sort of um, hopefully have more people building houses you know, where people need them. And also, um, if we increase the transparency of that process, 
we can do something which is, I suppose, is political with a small p, which is to change relationship between communities and how development takes place. We have a sort of mental model, which is that um, we're trying to help people make decisions around like where to build, what can I build here, how do I go about building. And to do that, in the modern age, there are lots of services which help us make decisions, like how do we get here from the railway station? You know, we use a service. Um, we are where, what houses are available for sale. There are lots of services which do that. Those services don't come about by magic. They come about because data is made available or they're able to collect data at scale. And um, so that's the kind of where we're starting out. If we can make data available uh, at scale, then this world of marketplace of services will erupt and then people will be able to make better decisions. And so there's an, there are a number of names and the trouble is a lot of those people building those services don't always identify with the names that we give them. But I guess there's plan tech, which we've seen with stickers around here, which is people helping planning decisions. And then there's prop tech, which is people helping build people build houses or make decisions about property. And you get quite a big bang for your book. You know, if you put um, if you put one data set out there, it, that can inform lots of decisions which you might not have predicted. So tree preservation orders, um, you could say they're just literally interesting when you buy and sell a house. They're a local land charge, but they're also interesting uh, to inform a design of a house or like which house, which land you buy. Uh, or how you even do plan making, you know, we've got lots of preserved trees in an area you might not allocate that for housing. Um, so, and for the that, those use cases, they don't just need like one information about one property, they need to have it in bulk and at scale nationally. <coughs> so a lot of this data can be related, it is about place, everything happens somewhere, as everybody says. Um, and so you can relate, you know, data, that data sets you make available by a geospatial location. So if you, if you provide points, which is an approximation, most things are an area, and then you can overlay those things so you can start to make sense of the world. But really, that's not good enough in a world that is actually um, three-dimensional. And, you know, this building is lots of different units. You know, a point isn't going to help you that much. So what we're looking for is identifiers. So if you can give each room or each building a number, um, yeah, and you can start to tie those things together. I, d I don't need to sort of data explain this room, I think, but it's sort of it's something that you need to explain to people who think, I know what three words is really interesting. It's sort of interesting for some use cases, but not when it comes to working out whether this room is, uh, who, who's paying the rates for this room. <coughs> so um, we sort of, another user we're looking at is, is policy makers. And I'm sort of surprised, I've surprised myself that I think these people are interesting, but I think they have, have an answer to a lot of our problems. And that comes down to the fact that um, in the UK, well, in, in England in particular, uh, which is where the department is, is based, is, is looking at, um, planning decisions are, are devolved, you know, devolved to local planning authorities, which could be a local authority, or it could be a national park, or it could be a development corporation. And they look after a bit of uh, a bit of the country, and they, as we've heard in the you know, like Great Map in Greater Manchester and other, other, other projects, there there's like a lack of consistency, and that's kind of the point really. Is that you're trying to devolve decisions to a local locality, then you're trying to help them do things differently, which which suits that place. But when you want to make a service, you want to have some information that is consistent, um, if not uniform. And so what can we do to sort of make that happen? Um, well, policymakers can do sort of, um, this is my mental model for a policymaker. Policymakers do lots of things. But in my world, I guess, they uh, can help us um, you know, seed uh, early stage developer development. You know, sometimes you need to lay some master turf to get some green shoots. Um, other times uh, we can sort of, um, when we want to make data available nationally, we can regulate, tell it be to make a brownfield land register or, or to uh, make the local plans available in this format. Um, we can sort of fund um, uh, people inside local authorities. So there is a, a sister project which is looking at funding projects, uh, the local government digital fund, which is trying to make projects uh, unlock data that's inside uh, local authorities. And quite often, you know, some of these data sets need money paying for to make them available. And then finally, there are some barriers to publishing. You know, um, there is some um, 
interpretation of like things like GDPR, but there's also some very basic things. Some of those identifiers and those polygons are restricted, you know, under the current sort of uh, licensing terms of Ordnance Survey and others. Um, so we've got a bunch of projects, and this is kind of how we're working, is we're, we're treating each of these projects as something which we'll take through a process which starts as an idea and ends up with some kind of standard or some kind of regulation or some kind of, a, of, a, of a, a system to unlock that data. These aren't things we prioritize based on you know, need. Not, they're not things that we prioritize, they're things that the department was, has prioritized. Um, and so we're grabbing onto teams where policymakers have decided that data has an answer and trying to help them you know, have a better outcome from that. And so we're using a digital process, um, which as we heard from Ashling, sort of like is, is like it's really important to actually go back to need. Uh, quite often things arrive as a solution, like a single register of this or a national data standard for that. And um, we try and take it back to need. Well, like what would happen um, if you made that, that data available nationally? You know, who, who, would, who would want to use it and what do you expect to happen as a result? And then we can use the digital process to test those ideas out, you know, hopefully cheaply. Uh, local plans is an area we're investigating at the moment. Feels quite big, um, but the value is massive. I mean, every local planning authority uh, has to publish um, a document every five years. Um, they're not particularly lovely. Um, the data in there is, is buried away in bitmaps and, um, and very hard to build into a service. And this is really one of the biggest pain points we have with data, is a lot of data isn't published as data. It isn't even managed as data, it's managed as documents. So um, one of the things we we've learned from our, our planning data discovery is quite often, you fill in a form which it looks like data, first thing it's done is it's turned into a, a document, and then that document is edited and managed, and almost like an email chain, rather than editing data. So can we sort of turn change the process so people work on the data rather than the documents. An example of this is local plans, like what the department knows about them. So we grabbed um, planning policy experts and we sat them down and we visited every single local authority website and tried to find their local plan, harder than you think, quite often, and then tried to find one piece of information for it. Well, we tried to find out where the local plan was in the process, which obviously people like PINs, the planning spectrates, publish information about when they see it. But on each local planning authority is like where the next one's being developed. And then we tried to get the number of houses they were, they were saying they were going to build. And we sort of, you made a tool and we sort of grabbed these numbers and we sort of like then sort of, you know, screenshotted the bit of the document we found. And we're using that sort of basically inform uh, a process for, um, improving the, the process of making local plans available. And so that involves all the design activities like post-it notes and workshops. One of the, si the points w the point of the process we're at the moment is can we tear that concept local plans into smaller things we can work on. These aren't the things, but they kind of gives you the idea of the process. And then we can grab one of those things and then go through a, an open process to end up with a specification which hopefully will work. So the file user, I guess, and for me is the most important user, is the people who make the data available. And you know, really what it comes down to is one of the biggest barriers we have is, is economics again. Um, you know, if you, if you have data in your local authority, um, you know, <laughs> and you can use it, then making it available externally comes at a risk and a cost. And unless you can see a direct benefit, it's quite hard to justify that. I think Gates had to be, have to be applauded for explaining so clearly the economic benefits of making brownfield land data and reducing risk of sites. That's not generally understood. So if we can show some value for making data available openly, that'll help. The other thing is, no two local authorities are similar. Um, they all have different ways of doing things. And like I said, that's kind of to be uh, encouraged. But if there's something we can do to help them sort of publish data in a consistent way, again, you know, we're sort of following in the in the sort of um, following the path beaten by people like uh, Data Mill North and ODI Leeds, where the, the, the list of um, rateable values is great in that kind of work, is pretty close to what we're doing. So we'll definitely learn from each other there. Um, 
one of the things we do need is like the brownfield sites i'm sure they're great well they're not so great but um one of the hardest problems of them is finding them um so it's like teaching the department that one of the things we should do is like keep the list of the lists you know register with our, the registers and so we're building processes for, to, for doing that and that kind of goes back to what another thing that, that uh, ODI leads uh, have done around like the, especially on the rates rateable values is building dashboards and feedback that's helpful to people making the data available and I guess that's one of the ways of overcoming that externality is to provide value to the publisher um, so we have a website I think oh you can't see that on the monitor but with digital hyphen land at uh, dot github dot io uh, and i'm around for a bit of time afterwards if you, if you want to talk to me about what we're doing okay, thanks. thank you if you're having trouble seeing the uh, link it will be available on the catapult website the video of today's session so you'll be able to find it there thank you very much do we have some questions for paul sure um Paul from Audio Leads again. So, property, land, housing, lots of consultants work in that world. Yeah. Have you spoken to any of them about how what you're doing can help them? And what have they said? So, we've done quite a lot of user research. I mean, the users we're researching by and large are people building the services, you know, our own policy makers and people in local authorities. Have spent to, spoke to a lot of stakeholders, I guess, is that kind of world. Um, um, how, what, how can I say this? So um, there are some behaviours which, you know, even you know, forward-thinking consultants, you know, don't think is a good a good thing. For example, local plans. There are local plans where lots of information and data is gathered, then it belongs to the the consultant who made that that local plan. So the local authority doesn't own its own intellectual property. So it's like some of this problem is not. It's not. You can't really feel bad about them it's really the system so can we help people make better contracts you know so those kind of outcomes come out the other thing is there are a lot of people who make money out of the current friction the current sort of system is you know <laughs> it, the, the game has value you know value to some incumbents so there will be some making data available is a disruptive activity you know so this I said that um, lack of information can kill a marketplace a public good can put kill a marketplace as well so you making data available openly, you're probably you know taking somebody's livelihood away from them because they might be making money out of that data already. So it's sort of all these things are calculations, and yeah, I mean government's got to do something. I mean housing market needs something doing, and but you know, it's yeah. So the the argument that making data available takes people's livelihoods away. I think uh, we just need to cut across that right now and just say that's just a, a disastrous approach because if yeah. we don't, those th those frictions yeah. which allow small operators or people to... to, to so th that's probably not a really brilliant wording on my part and I'm probably going to regret that. But, um, no, no, but I think, but, yeah, but I yeah. think it's, I suppose it's, it's disruptive and so disruption is, is not always just yeah. creative. It can be disruptive as well. Yeah. Creative disruption is... Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, I mean, it's a tricky thing. I think, um, by and large, you know, the, the value is not making the data available. It's providing insights and uh, informing decisions. And that's where you pay for the money. And there's much more money in that. And actually, a lot of people start off with property technology thinking, oh, I'm going to make this amazing thing to like, build SimCity. And then they end up clearing, cleaning up some spreadsheets. So we can lift them up to where they can make a sim city. Then that, I think everybody will help be pleased with us. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, you can clap. So we're slightly running behind time. So I just thought we'd move straight into Giles from o, um, ODI. Thank you very much. So, so I've got a minute. I've got a minute, have I? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's get this. And how do I? Let's get my timer started. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about a piece of work that we've done at ODI Leeds with um, Connected Places Catapult. Um, they were called FCC when we started it, but it wasn't that long ago because it's only a, a recent uh, name change. Um, and the, the story of this starts actually, but this is before my involvement, starts with a, 
a blog post and an associated sprint um, from, from about this time last year. Um, that's a link which is not really helpful on here, but there's a, there's a really great blog post. Um, uh, and and the, I was taken by this quote, um, we've been somewhat dismayed by the paucity of publicly available data on land and hold, uh, land holdings and build out rates. So that, was, that came from a, a report um, that Oliver Letwin wrote, and it was one of the, the key points. Um, so FCC, uh, FCC CPC, CPC did a, a great bunch of um, uh, research and, and prototyping um, around, uh, around that, spoke to loads of councils, found that there was some really great practice, but quite a lot of people going around on buses to count um, houses being completed. So this is all about how big is the, uh, the housing uh, uh, stock. Um, and, and they effectively posed this question, is, is there any way we can do better? Um, so, you know, visualise the way of doing that. Really great prototyping, some amazing thoughts there. And then they came to us to say, you know, can you do something to demonstrate how feasible this is? So our prototyping hypothesis was, is there a way of interpreting data that's out there, somehow linking it together, and then inferring or reporting uh, information out of that? Um, and, and really the crux of it was, can we use open data, by which, just in case there's anyone not clear what open data is, data that's accessible, available, for anybody to use, interpret, you know, even your nan, I think, as somebody said, um, uh, to count these housing completions. So can we use those sources of data uh, to do that? And, and to be honest, it became apparent as we were doing it that if we get this right, there's some really other interesting things you can come up with. So not only can you say, you know, 7,000 new houses in Leeds this year, but here's the mix of those houses in terms of affordability, in terms of... Um, uh, eco-friendliness, uh, all that kind of stuff. So there was quite a lot that, that could actually come out of this. Um, <coughs> this is another, another hand-drawn slide. I'm very, very a great fan of, uh, of Paul's slides. Um, so here's what we did. So we, we went around and identified a bunch of um, open data sets, uh, importantly with dates. And, and we made the assertion that if we know when a thing happened, then we can effectively turn that into an event that's occurred to a scheme. So here's a scheme of building. Right at the very beginning of that, you know, maybe there's some planning work going on and planning decisions are made. If we've got a data set which says planning decisions and dates of those, then we've got one point of reference for, for a, a piece of development. And then we've got right at the other end of a scheme you've got people moving in and starting to you know starting to occupy those premises that's a pretty clear sign that that house has been completed um, <coughs> so um, and we, we use as a proxy for that occupancy or the, the completion end of that that uh, life cycle the idea of um, of council tax bandings um, the reason we use that is uh, is typically that tends to occur towards the back end of that process. You don't get house you know, council tax funding because as soon as you've got that, you've got to start paying council tax. So developers are you know, obviously keen that that doesn't hang around on their books for a long time. Um, and, and a really nice thing that certainly the Leeds data set that we were working with publishes is they publish a date that a banding was created. So most of them are sort of early 90s when council tax was brought in. Um, but anything that's after that uh, gives us a pretty good sign that that's a new property. Uh, Stockport, by the way, have done the same kind of thing. They use that very, a very similar approach to try and automate some bits of their process. So there's some really kind of, you know, interesting things that we can do with it. Now, obviously, you know, as we built this out, we could add, we can add other sources of data in to get a, you know, higher level of confidence that building is occurring. But the principle was, well, let's take things from either end of that uh, that life cycle and see if, see what we can infer from them. Um, by the way, I was inspired by um, something called event sourcing, which is a thing which is in software engineering. Basically, you can reconstruct the state of, of a data store by looking at the individual things that occur to it. And I, I was thinking about what you were saying, Paul, about, about this, you know, the, the email chain. You know, it's almost like breaking it down into the individual events that have occurred to a thing is a really powerful thing. And what it does is it enables us to be really sparse about this. So we can build something which is good enough, but then we can add to it later 
you know it's it's a really it's it's quite a quite a strong uh, strong pattern that I think we might uh, develop further. So that's uh, that's the the basic overall uh, approach to it, and then this is as technical as it's going to get today. We've got our little data sets here, which we process and you know churn around, turn into a standardised format, and we poke it into an API layer that we built. That gets stored in a database, which is as simple as we could make it. It's got a table with events in it and a table with schemes, and they're kind of linked together by a very fine thread. And then we can query that API to try and do things like, for example, look at the number of council tax registrations in a particular area. Uh, we can do things like looking at the planning text to try and work out how many properties are being planned in that area. That's not an easy thing to do, <laughs> especially because, uh, A, you might not get the entire thing. Uh, you get all sorts of weird stuff, like we're going to demolish 10 properties and build 15. Well, so you know, simply looking at the numbers isn't enough there. You need to have some knowledge about what's, what's happening. But you know, we had some success. So that's our, our sort of essential uh, approach to, to pulling it together. <coughs> Here's the ideal. This is my. Uh, my shiny example of when it works well, okay? It's not, not huge numbers, okay, but here's our event stream. So we've got applying permission on the 21st of January, 2016. Here's the description, chain of use of bank to three self-contained apartments. So we were able to pick up self-contained apartments and there's a number. That might mean that there's three of these things. Great, we'll, we'll mark three down. And then, you know, in November that, that, that same year, three council tax registrations associated with that property. The way I'm doing that association, by the way, is through um, geographic location. So I've got the red line for the, for the development, and um, I think I've queried the Google API to try and get the, the, the location for the address um, for, the, for that, and then sort of just did a bit of um, simple geo, geo querying on uh, Mongo, which is what I'm storing it in. Sorry, too technical. Um, got that, I've got three council tax registrations, so three equals three. Good, it's surprising, surprisingly few came up that well. Actually, maybe not surprisingly few came up that well. Here's something else we can do, because we've got the council tax plans, we can you know, come up with handy little graphs of, uh, of the, the properties. I've got the, the prototype's not live, because there was some, I was talking about the geo data, that geographic data was not um, uh, ready to come by, shall we say? So I had to find. Um, is anyone from Leeds here? Yeah, sorry. I, I found a, a slightly um, grey manner, shall we say, of finding the the red lines for the planning um, uh, planning schemes and, and managed to extract it. But um, maybe talk to you about security later. Um, <laughs> but uh, so so I had to had to augment the data that I got out, which is one of the key lessons. Is this is great if it works, if we've got that linking that Paul was talking about, if we've got the, 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 you know, the, the geographic stuff, or ideally a, a proper linking uh, concept, this would work a lot better. Um, so the hard stuff, cross-referencing um, is difficult. Um, I used geography, it's not infallible, um, especially as you know, you get council tax registrations happening in, you know, in a very close area to, to a, another development. Suddenly they might get tagged inadvertently in, into that one. So it's not, a, not a, an ideal thing. One, one minute. Okay. Yes, I am winding it. Um, the actual open data sets themselves don't really have that in there. So I had to go through some slightly uh, securitous routes to, to add that in there. Um, and and uh, it's really difficult to extract meaning out of unstructured text. So that you know, the, the planning data doesn't really tell you, unless you're reading it, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's great, but it's not very easy to, to, uh, to do that at scale uh, in an automated fashion. Um, uh, what could we do in the future? Well, we could actually take this into a local authority. That would actually get around some of the, the data um, um, uh, structuring issues, so that you know, the, the open data being published without geo, we could get away get around that by using it inside the scope of the council. Um, I've mentioned already we could add further event sources into that to get a, a richer picture. Um, this is a key one, and I think, Paul, you mentioned that as well, so I was very pleased to see. We, we need to get 
much clearer guidance around what it's possible to and what it's not possible to publish. And for the things that it's not possible to publish, we need to find out well why is that, and actually you know start pushing at those those things. But a lot of a lot of times, it's a question of we've heard on the grapevine that we're not allowed to publish anything to do with addresses, so consequently we'll just strip it out of all of our data sets, and then no one's going to shoot us. And that's fine, but it's not you know kind of a great in, a great sort of uh, thing. Um, and and ideally, if we can standard uh, standardise a little bit around the stuff we'd really like to come along with planning data. So, for example, how many properties, you know, of, and of what classification does this uh, cover? Which other planning things does this relate to? Does it supersede? You know, that would be really nice. So we could start to build that sort of, sort of better linked picture. Um, we've we've blogged about it because, as Paul keeps saying, we're radically open. Um, <coughs> So we blogged about it. You can, you know, re read all our stuff. You can see the code. That's all on on GitHub. So um, uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giles. Any last questions for Giles? Sure. <laughs> I, I think one of the, the pleas in this is MHCLG. Can we just just tell councils to standardise their processes? I mean, we we just help so much. You know, I mean. You know, we, we don't, I mean, this is a classic one for me, as Gay said. I, I have officers literally jumping in the cars to get around just to work out which house has been built or not been built. And, um, you know, there is no requirement on developers to sell us when they're starting, when they're completed, or anything like that. And, and it's a massive drain on, on council resources. And, it, and, and with the flick of a switch, it, it, it could all be easily done. I mean, a, a lot of the states could be just with the flick of an MHCRD. You know, they, they would make us do it. You know, yeah, sta standardize our local plan. Tell all the local authorities to have an interactive map. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, working in local government, until the, the, the budgets are tight, so tight now that unle unless we get, unless there is an instruction, they will not do any, anything because the budgets are just not there to do it. It, it, it just needs a flick of a, a flick of a switch and say, do it. And, and, and taking on board that point about. There are consultants out there who just cut and paste the planning portal, and that's how they make the money. It's because that they have the knowledge. It's it, that is the that is the issue. Is is and that's what's putting on small builders. They just don't have the knowledge because they're not the, the the data isn't there for them. The, you have intermediaries who are saying, "I hold all the knowledge and I hold all the data." That's where they're making the money, and and that's where the small so, so, you know that's where the the, the 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 releasing of the data will will be a disruptor because those smaller consultants or the bigger consultants no longer can cut and paste the planning portal oh, no, i know it wasn't that's fine <laughs> it was a very well well made point so i was going to say uh, i just applaud this kind of work because um i mean you're right that the department could just tell the country to do something but working out what that is, is the bit that we want to put more thought into because uh, I don't, I mean, I think Brownfield sites and you, you, what you showed was great around Brownfield sites, but nationally it wasn't as, you know, as good as what the work you've done. And so um, if we did something which went with the grain of the way local authorities work, which I think is what you're doing, you're sort of like spotted business persons which exist in every single local authority. And then you demonstrate how that data has use to the local authority and to the wider community. I really like your point about the Gateshead Pound. You know, that, that kind of thing is, is the kind of thing we want to enable. So p you, you doing the work of piloting helps us then say, okay, this is something we should do nationally. And then we can, you know, write the regulation for that. Yeah, and I think, you know, we spoke pre previously about this. I think it is about, you know, very, very minimal guidance on yeah. look, just publish these additional things and suddenly your data set is that much more useful. So yeah, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really simple stuff. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions for all the speakers before Neil heads out? <laughs> thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. Sure. It's, it's more kind of a wider question to, to the audience as well. Has anyone uh, spoken to the Land Registry about kind of their opening of their data? We're trying to go through the Geospatial Commission. Has anyone spoken to So I spent quite a bit of time in Land Registry. Um, I was at GDS before I joined the department, so I was sort of um, parachuted into <laughs> Plymouth for a while. So I can tell you a bit about Land Registry stuff. I mean, they, they've got a tough, tough gig, you know. I mean, um, I mean, it's, it's basically um, the film Goldeneye 
mentions the land registry is one of the things that they're going to you know take us back to the stone age by destroying them it's a really important data set so th and they're guardians of that that data so we can tell you a bit about their their constraints so just a final one um if you want to join in and try and build some new stuff come to our open gov tech thing in heaven bridge and uh, create what we're going to do decide what we're going to do next Mother and Bikes, yeah, come to that. Um, it's really easy on the train from Manchester and Leeds, not so much from London, but but hey, <laughs> that's that's cool. And there's loads of great pubs in Hebden as well, which we'll go to. This is true. Just to add to that as well, Sorry. if you're not aware, there's a Slack workspace for all things Plantech. <coughs> all things Plantech. So um, either get in touch with myself or Nisa at the end, or Ashling. We can give you the details, and you can join and see all the different projects that are happening across the country and the globe. There, we've got people from Australia, the US, um, also Finland on there, and sharing the things that they're doing. Um, I, I would like to apologise just for running a little bit over time. It's the nature of these sorts of events. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, and Neil, who's now left. Thank you to everyone for coming. A spe special big thanks to ODI for hosting this. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you can stay in touch with all the things on Slack. You can uh, come to our Plantech conference in September um, and feel free to grab some food and have some breakfast. And yeah, thank you again for coming. <laughs>